Our clothes reflect the history of civilization. In a modern world, clothing is more than our second skin, with fashion and style becoming the way of expressing our individuality. To see deep symbolism in material universe, to speak with things, objects and rituals is intrinsic in the Kazakhs. That's why the history of national costume showcases an amazing world, revealing our mentality. We are all familiar with Kazakh fairy tales, epic poems and songs that we learned by heart when we were children. Aldar Kose, Yer Tostik, Kis Jibek. Today, these are considered our greatest asset and legacy. The epic poems reflect a holistic picture of the life of the people, whereas characters of fairy tales teach us what is good and what is bad. Today, we decided to find out what role does traditional costume play in folklore. The Kazakhs have a rich oral tradition, the roots of which stem from ancient times. More than 40 different genres of oral tradition have made it to these days. Those are ritual, historical, wedding and funeral songs, aitas, heroic epic poems, quiz, sayings, proverbs, riddles, instructive tales and so on. If we think of culture as the combination of spiritual and material values, recreated by nomadic spiritual heritage, then we need to acknowledge that the art of clothing and the art of jewellery making occupy a special place and have a special meaning. Indeed, it is a very special page in the history of culture. Everything we have, yurts, horse harness, nomadic weapons, are part of our culture. Now, I want to mention these two objects, Kazakh clothes and Kazakh jewelries. Both are meant to be in harmony with each other. If we talk about the fabrics and materials that were used, we will see that only gentle, clean, natural materials were used in their production because nomads lived in the steppe, partly in the forest, partly in the mountains, but mostly in the steppe. Traditions dictated what a person was supposed to wear at certain moments of his life, at a funeral, at a matchmaking gathering, during the bride's farewell party and at other important events. For example, at Kazakh weddings, the Betashar ceremony is performed. Akin, or an improvisational poet, performs a ritual song and introduces the bride to her new family. At the end of the ceremony, he lifts her veil with the tip of his dombra revealing the face of the future Kelin, or daughter-in-law. Another example of how elements of traditional clothing were incorporated into folklore was the bride's farewell ceremony, where she says goodbye to her parents, girlfriends, and her native village. In some regions, a girl would sing Sinsu song and take off her hat takia, while her father would put on her saukile. The wedding attire of the Kazakh bride also refers to the folklore, as well as to the beliefs of the ancient nomads. The traditional Kazakh wedding outfit has a deep meaning behind it, especially the bride's costume. First of all, the shape and silhouette of a dress is always a trapezoid, extended at the bottom, which should be understood as a symbol of the world mountain. The same applies to the cone-shaped saukile, the bride's headwear. The main color of the traditional wedding costume was of course red in all its forms, from a bright scarlet shade to a deep burgundy or purple. All this was combined with sophisticated embroidery in gold and silver. Were there any other colors in the bride's wedding dress? Yes, there were. This could depend on a number of factors. For example, in some regions of Kazakhstan, green and blue fabrics were used, but red was used as a rule. It was always preferred over any other color. In spring, when nature is revived, all the people of Kazakhstan and residents of Central Asian countries impatiently wait for their favorite Nauris holiday. 
Apart from the most festive atmosphere, the colourful and bright costumes please everybody's size. In March, yurts are erected on the streets of modern cities and towns, and residents sport nomadic-style costumes. The males are dressed as batirs, akins, and horsemen, while females wear traditional dresses and kimisheks. Elders sport their chapans, and in these traditional outfits, people of Kazakhstan congratulate each other with the arrival of spring and gather to sip the traditional Nauris Koje drink. The information about the unique characters who lived in the steppe has made it to our days. They travel from village to village, dressed in bright, extravagant clothes. The thing is that there were many unique people, bearers of our culture in the steppe. Think of Baksi or Salsari. Salsari was a nomadic theatre. It was genetically linked to the ancient traditions of the Kazakh theatre, to the shamans, Baksi, fortune tellers and soothsayers. And therefore their clothes differed from the clothes of all other people. Their clothes, their behaviour and their world outlook. It was all different because they were the initiators of comedy and tragedy. Just like the Kabuki theatre in Japan and other theatres. The Kazakhs too had their own nomadic theatre called Sal City. They were dressed differently. They were dressed in expensive fabrics like cotton or silk. Their fabrics were multicoloured. One part of the outfit could be red, the other could be white. Shamans Baksi used to be in different category. They were fortune tellers and healers. They could heal wounds and various diseases. Well, they could or they couldn't. Now it is called quakery. But generally speaking, people who were natural biologists, physicists, and who could understand chemical reactions, they were treating people with herbs, were making poisons, or were putting an evil eye on the enemies. They understood the calendar cycles. They were able to predict when the famine or bad harvest will happen. They knew what, where, when, and who was born, what years will be the hard years, when the ancient prophecies should not be repeated, and what was needed to be done during the cattle plague. They knew what places should be explored, where to go, they could read the stars, so these people's clothing reflected the nature. They wore a tiger, raccoon or a bear skin, or they would wear clothes decorated with all kinds of bright feathers, bells and coloured pebbles. This was all made to attract attention, because they were the bearers of a completely different knowledge of a different culture. The most respected representatives of the society were performers, Akins and Jirao. The competition between Akins or poets improvisers was the most popular event in the village. They tried to surpass one another in their talents in competitions. Great attention was paid to their costumes and to the decorations of their musical instruments. Dombras were decorated with various gems, so were the females' clothes. In women's jewellery, pearls and corals were very common. Turquoise and carnelian were popularly used too. These were perhaps the two most common precious stones. Rubies were used less, whereas amber was more common, although amber cannot be mined on the territory of Kazakhstan. So this is the evidence of close cultural and commercial ties between the most distant countries and continents, the heritage of the Great Silk Road. Strange as it may seem, but amber and even cowrie shells, which are not intrinsic in Kazakhstan, were actively used in decoration of Sao Kele, for instance. As for the symbolic meaning of different precious and semi-precious stones, as I said, the most popular ones were turquoise and carnelian. Turquoise is a landmark stone for the Eastern culture in general. This blue turquoise color, it was directly identified with the upper world and accordingly had only the most positive meaning. It was believed that turquoise has a positive effect on well-being, on the health of the wearer of this stone. It was believed that the stone was a lucky charm that attracted luck to its owner. 
People learned how to use silver and copper in ancient times. If we talk about silver, it is mentioned in the famous epic poem Giz Jibek, where the author compares fine, delicate and beautiful fingers of the main female character with a silver thread. So it makes us realize that this comparison is about the beauty of the girl. A special place in Kazakh folklore is occupied by the amulets. According to the nomadic beliefs, the world was inhabited by various spirits, both evil and good. For people, it was necessary to protect themselves from misfortune. The Kazakh's ancestors created not only protective amulets and talismans, but also when making clothes, paid great attention to the areas of the body, which were considered the most vulnerable. Therefore, the Uki Ayak pendants were hanging from the sides of the temples, and the chest area, wrists and forehead were protected with the amulets. Even today, the jewellery that is decorated with the claws and feathers of an eagle owl, the bird that was considered sacred in the steppe, is still popular among the Kazakhs. The epic poem called Kambar Batir that tells us the story of the events of the 16th century was preserved. Describing the heroine of the epic poem, the beautiful Nazim, the anonymous author mentioned the jewellery, amulet. After a while, Nazim knelt down and bowed to the people three times, and her jewellery, made from eagle owl feathers, oscillated along with her movements, and her diamond embroidery sparkled from her hat. The claws of an eagle owl, the feathers of an eagle owl, and not just an eagle owl, but also many other birds were also associated with the upper world, with the world of spirits, and they were thought to protect their owners from the evil eye. And it is no coincidence that such a large number of feathers were present in the shaman's outfit. Many shamans even wore vests made of swan feathers and swan fluff. This was their way to connect with the world of spirits, with the upper world. And women's outfit, the outfits of young girls had these feathers too. By the way, these feathers were supposed to drive away anything that could harm the future mother. As for the costumes of older women, these feathers were not necessarily supposed to be worn on the top of the head, or rather on top of the headwear. They could be suspended somewhere on the side, even hidden underneath the clothes. They still were protecting their owners. It is noteworthy that in folklore works, not only was jewellery considered as lucky charm, but also as showy accessory. Describing the details of costumes, masters of oral tradition were able to skillfully convey the mood, behaviour and harmony of the world around them. Philologist Kairat Janabayev emphasises the fact that the classic poet Makjan Janabayev compared the ringing of girls' pendants with the dripping of melting snow. And this is aesthetically beautiful. In addition, the ringing of pendants served as a way of communication between the characters. This was remarkably described in the Abais way, the novel written by the Kazakh classic Mukhtar Awezov, in the scene where the beautiful Tokjan meets the young poet Abai. Tokjan enters the youth and sees Abai. This was their first meeting. And Tokjan waits on him. The fading silver ringing of her shoulder was moving away outside the door of the youth. Abai's heart was pounding. Meaning that when she arrived, he heard her shoulder. And this can be considered as the communicative moment because Tokjan liked him and he liked her too. And these shoulder, this was about their dialogue. She couldn't speak about her love. She rang. This doesn't mean that she was frivolous. This was about her beauty, and that was their conversation. Ornaments had a special place in the folk costumes too. The ancient nomads were inspired by everything that they saw, and mainly by the moon, the sun and the heaven while creating. In the Kazakh ornaments, one can find floral, flowers, branches, shamrocks and zoomorphic theme, a silhouette of the ram's horn. Geometric patterns in the form of ovals, triangles and circles were also popular. 
As a matter of fact, the traditional Kazakh ornament can be divided into several types. These are geometric ornaments, floral ornaments and zoomorphic ornaments, ornaments with animals' image. There are also astral and cosmogonic ornaments. In all these ornaments, in one form or another, in one interpretation or another, can be found in a traditional Kazakh costume. Of course, floral or zoomorphic ornaments are always the basis, but they all have different variations, especially the ram's horn pattern. The ram was considered a symbol of the upper world, and its twisted horn a symbol of fertility. As for cosmogonic images, things like solar circle were often placed on the back of men's robes, for instance. There were many types of embroidery made in the shape of solar circles. As I said, a floral zoomorphic ornament was the most basic one. It was supposed to express the course of life, the circle of life, and symbolically, it expressed the most favorable meanings. And one more small detail, it is no coincidence that the ornament was placed along the neck, sides of the garment and on the lower part of the sleeve. The ornament was protecting the wearer from being touched by evil spirits. An evil spirit cannot creep under the collar, which is surrounded by these symbolic ornaments. Folklore is not only about the oral tradition, it is also a manifestation of material culture, such as ceremonies, crafts, and of course, folk costume. We see echoes of folklore traditions at family celebrations and during Naori's folk festival. We can learn about the history of national clothes from literature, media, or on the internet. The images and costumes of heroes from epic poems migrated into the paintings of artists. Cinema and theatre often resort to folk theme too. Besides, ethnic style clothes are an integral part of the performances of folk ensembles. Today, the performances of various ethnographic folklore bands look very unique on the stage. These bands are Sarin, Turan, Khasak and Al-Aki ensembles. All artists are usually dressed in performance costumes designed by designers and fashion houses. For example, the outfits of the Al-Aki band became the object of analysis in the book Folklore written by researcher Daniar Mergaliev. We quote, The traditional cut, design, ornament and colour are reflected in the costumes. Of all the traditional elements of the costume, hats, mori, are the closest to their traditional versions, as well as the colour scheme that are bright and decorative. By the middle of the 20th century, the traditional costume of nomads were kept in museums. But the variations of Kazakh traditional clothes were revived in the theatre, cinema, opera and on stage. This is a rather controversial issue. There are lots of debates these days about how close is the Kazakh costume that we see on stage to its original version. Naturally, the question, when did such variations appear, is one of the most popular one. But this happened relatively recently. It happened in the middle of the 20th century, in the Soviet years, with the development of theatre, opera and ballet. The ballet had its own demands. They replaced the flexibility of the costume, to the expressiveness of its forms, to their convenience. The opera had different requirements, and the costume had to adapt to them. So the standards of how the ethnic costumes should look like and how they should be made have changed. Not only that, of course, there was a demand to create some beautiful, expressive, recognizable image that could be associated with folk traditions. If we look at the works of the outstanding Kazakh artist Aisha Galimbaeva, we will see vivid examples of how the Kazakh costume can be styled and transformed. From the history of the National Theatre, we know that the first plays that were staged were the plays based on folklore. 
Performances like Kiz Jibek, Koblandi, Ayman Sholpan and others were the first to dazzle on stage. Over time, the repertoire was re-adapted. The approach to stage clothes in ethnic style has changed too. For example, there is a production in which the protagonist of fairy tales Aldar Kose looks modern, stylish and even positioned as a hip-hopper. In Kazakhstan, the folk style is still relevant. Let's say that Asil Design Fashion House adheres to new folklore traditions. The designer Aya Bapani sticks to the technology of felting and ornaments can often be found in the works of Baghdad Akilbekova, Manzura Kabieva, Asil Nusip Kojanova and other designers. The costume designers of the Soviet period were also inspired by the nomad costume. It was with the initiative of Irina Dobrokhotova Maikova that Kazakh modeling of clothes arrived on stage. She was the first to use the traditions of the national Kazakh costume in fashionable clothes. She was the chief artist and fashion designer, the head of the Kazakhstan Fashion House. In fact, once Kazakhstan gains its independence, this trend has only intensified. The demand for ethnic costume increased, and not only for its interpretation in ready-to-wear clothes, but also for ethnic-styled stage costumes, presentation costumes and image costumes. That is, we can say, is the second wave, along with the development of ethnic traditions in preta porta clothing. We see the revival of the national costume itself. It is believed that the folk style in clothing was introduced by representatives of the hippie culture. But among the couturiers, one of the first who tried to combine tradition and fashion was Yves Saint Laurent. In the late 60s, he released a collection that featured African themes. As for the modern giants of the fashion industry who experimented with folk fashion, one can name Roberto Cavalli, Dolce & Gabbana and John Galliano. Each of them has created ethnic-styled outfits more than once. Ethnic and folklore style can be reflected in a modern, fashionable outfit in different ways. It can be a cut, for example, a straight tunic-shaped cut, which is intrinsic in folk clothes, and it can be easily adapted in any modern outfit. Textiles, ethnic textiles, such as Uzbek fabrics, for instance, or some types of quilted clothes are common with Kazakh outerwear. This can be a patchwork technique or anything that is connected with textiles and surface decor, characteristic of any ethnic group. This can be an ornament that is either borrowed or adapted. Techniques for the execution of these ornamental themes, they can be preserved. Say, if it is embroidery, then it will be an embroidery, or they can be changed or even improved using innovative technologies, such as laser or machine embroidery. It all depends on what task the artist, the creator of this image, sets before himself and what methods and technologies he uses. Over the past year, many Kazakh designers were presenting their works in different cities and countries. In 2019, the Kazakhstan Fashion Day exhibition was held in Amsterdam. Young designers Zarina Akshulakova, Safina Yahyaeva and Zekien and Kunke fashion houses presented national clothing for both adults and children. In the autumn, there was a presentation of a new collection in Paris in which Juldis Khuspanova, Malik Usupova, Gulzira Temirgalieva and Elsa Kalieva participated. One of the guests, developer of fashion brands Peter Prada even said that pastel colours, bright colours, all this resembles history, but in a modern interpretation. Not everyone admires Europe and dreams of conquering Paris. Aydar Khan Kaliev, a designer from Taras, aims to conquer China. He creates clothes in the style of Kazakh neo folklore. Today, his clothes are sold both in Urumqi shopping centers and in the largest online store, Alibaba.
Today, we were able to immerse ourselves into the history of Kazakh folk art and to learn about the features of the folk style in clothing. These days, any modern fashionista has a wide choice of traditional jewellery, turquoise, lucky charms, vests with beautiful ornaments and dresses in national style. But whatever you are going to choose, choose the things that you truly like.